welcome to choosing the right database for modern applications. My name is Michele Ricciardi. I am a specialist solutions architect based in Singapore, and I work with developers across APJ. In my time at AWS, I help hundreds of customers select the best database for their modern applications. And in this session, I will show you how to select the right database technology for each workload and what benefits that can bring. In today's agenda, we will first cover what are the benefits of decoupling the data and why there is a need of using purpose-built databases. Then I will use a fictional workload to show you the process of decomposing a monolithic application into microservices and how to pick the best database for each use case. And lastly, I will show you a demo of a decomposed application and compare it with the initial monolithic application. So let's get started. When it comes to decomposing monolithic architectures, one pitfall and anti-pattern is to decompose the application layer but utilize a single database for all the microservices. This is an anti-pattern as it leads to runtime coupling of the data across the microservices. Coupling of the data means that the services are not fully independent as each microservice needs its own data. With this approach, the database becomes the integration layer between all of the microservices, and as a result, multiple microservices need to be tested and deployed together. Another approach I have seen is to utilize a single database across the microservices with logical separation of that data. For example, with separate schemas for each service. With this separation of the data, the database doesn't act as the integration layer anymore, and you need to think about how the microservices integrate with each other outside of that database. So this forces you, as a developer, to think about boundaries between microservices and design those services to be loosely coupled and independently deployable. However, with this approach, we still do not realize all the benefits of microservices. The database becomes the single point of failure and it still requires being operated and scaled as a single unit. For this reason, when decoupling applications, each service should not only own the data, but it should also own its separate database. With separate databases per microservice, each service is truly independent. Each microservice can evolve at its own pace. You can perform releases, patches, or changes without worrying about affecting other microservices. Each database can also be scaled independently. And lastly, with this approach, you can select the right database for each microservice. So what does it mean to select the right database for each microservice? As a developer, you have many choices of databases. And moving from the one-size-fits-all approach will give you the freedom to pick the right database to meet the unique requirements for each wor workload. And once you pick the right database for your workload, you can focus on building applications to meet the business needs and leverage features of the database engine that suits your workload. Traditionally, a barrier for adopting purpose-built databases were the potential operational overheads. So this included investments in upfront hardware or software and expertise to make them scalable, highly available, and performant. This is why AWS offers the widest variety of databases that are purpose-built for different types of applications. We offer the broadest and deepest portfolio of over 15 purpose-built databases that supports needs of different data models. And by leveraging these fully managed databases, AWS takes care of the undifferentiated heavy lifting required to operate and manage these different database technologies. So AWS provides databases to match every use case, such as relational, key value, document, and many others. So with this wide variety of database choices available to you, how would you go about selecting the right database for your particular use case? The approach I recommend is to analyze each of the use case, define its requirements, and then select a database based on those requirements. So let me walk you through an example and show you how to apply this. 
In this example, we will look at Awesome Pets. In this made-up scenario, Awesome Pets is an online pet store. Awesome Pets has all of the characteristics of an e-commerce store, where you can browse a catalog, add items to the basket, and check out. So currently, Awesome Pets tech stack consists of a legacy monolithic backend and a monolithic database. This monolithic application powers all of the different features and functionality of Awesome Pets. So the first step in any application decomposition is to identify the key business capabilities that make up the application. In this scenario, we have four main use cases, the order management, inventory, the cart, and the catalog. We'll go through each one of these use cases in more details and explore which database best suits the need of each use case. Let's start with the order management. This use case is the typical online transaction processing. The order management is in charge of processing new orders, track the status of each order, and issue refunds and can cancellation. This use case requires strong data consistency, and the data structure does not change very often, making it a good fit for normalized data. As you may already guessed, this use case will benefit from leveraging a relational database. Relational data is highly structured, then the data is broken up into tables, and their relationships are enforced by the databases using primary and referential keys. Amazon Aurora is one of the available relational database services on AWS. Amazon Aurora is compatible with both MySQL and PostgreSQL, and it provides up to five times more throughput of standard MySQL and up to three times more of standard Postgres. It can auto-scale storage resources, and it durably stores data six ways across three availability zones. And since it's a managed service, it automates time-consuming administration tasks like hardware provisioning, database setup, patching, and backups. Therefore, for the order processing use case, we will leverage Amazon Aurora. Next, we will look at the inventory use case. The inventory use case has very simple functionality. It keeps track of every pet available in the store. It has very well-defined access patterns. Pets can either be added or removed from the inventory. So this use case needs to be low latency because during peak times, there could be thousands or even millions of items per hour being added and removed to the inventory. So the inventory also requires some schema flexibility allowing for certain items to have more fields than others. And this is why this use case lends itself well to a key value database. A key value database is a type of non-relational database that uses a, key, a simple key value method to store the data. A key value database stores data as a collection of key value pairs in which the key serves as a unique identifier for them. Key value databases are designed to partition or pa shard its data and then physically store it in separate partitions based on those partition keys. And that design allows it to horizontally scale to virtually any scale whilst providing consistent response time. Amazon DynamoDB is a key value NoSQL database. It is fully managed and serverless, meaning it takes care of provisioning, software patching, security, and it also automatically scales. DynamoDB enables you to build workloads with consistent single-digit millisecond response times at virtually any scale. And it also has the ability to replicate data globally for multi-region workloads. Therefore, for the inventory workload, I have selected Amazon DynamoDB. Let's now take a look at the cart use case. This functionality allows users to add items to the cart as they're browsing through the site and only check out once they have added all the items to the cart. This use case is high throughput as every item added or deleted to the basket needs to be recorded in the database. And this functionality needs to be fast. Adding and removing items to the basket is a synchronous operation and response times should be in sub-milliseconds. 
Lastly, the card data is very simple. It can be represented in a map data structure. So this use case requirement can be met with an in-memory database. In-memory databases will store your data in memory rather than on disk, which then provides with sub-millisecond response times. In-memory databases are ideal for applications that require microsecond response times or that have large spikes in traffic. You can see some of the common use cases of in-memory databases in this slide, such as caching, session storage, and leaderboards, to name a few. And one of the in-memory database services in AWS is Amazon Elasticache. Amazon Elasticache supports two in-memory data stores, Redis and Memcached. Amazon Elasticache can be either used for caching or as a primary data store for use cases that don't require high durability. In the context of awesome pets, the card data only needs to be persisted for a short amount of time, and we do not have high durability requirements. Therefore, we will use Amazon Elasticache. However, for use cases where you'd like to use an in-memory data store as the primary database and also have high durability requirements, you have the option of Amazon MemoryDB for Redis. MemoryDB is a fully compatible with Redis, and to achieve high durability, it leverages a distributed transaction log across availability zones. This enables durability, but also fast failover, database recovery, and node restarts. Lastly, let's take a look at Awesome Pets catalog use case. The catalog functionality allows users to browse all of the available pets in the store. And in the future, Awesome Pets would like to expand the search capabilities to allow for more complex search, such as searching by a specific term. Also in the catalog, Awesome Pets displays a count for each pet. Therefore, it needs to perform some data aggregations and counts. Lastly, this data can be stored as documents. So for this use case, we can leverage the Amazon Open Search service. The Amazon Open Search service is a managed service that makes it easy to deploy, operate, and scale Open Search. And Open Search is a distributed open source search and analytics suite used for a broad set of use cases like real-time application monitoring, log analytics, and website search, making it a perfect fit for the Awesome Pets catalog. So now that we've looked at each of the use cases and selected a database, this is how the final architecture looks like. As you can see, we have one microservice for each use case with the respective database. And at this point, you might be asking yourself a few questions about the architecture. One question might be, with separate databases and uh, separate microservices, how can we deal with updates that need to be propagated across those microservices boundaries? For example, the catalog needs to be updated every time that there is a change in the inventory. So how do we do that? To solve this challenge, we can leverage the event notification pattern. In this example, we can leverage Amazon DynamoDB streams to notify the catalog every time a new pet is added or an existing pet is deleted from the inventory and update the catalog accordingly. Another question you might be asking yourself is, how do you deal with transactions that span multiple microservices? For example, when a user proceeds to checkout, the application will need to get the cart, update the inventory, and store the order. To solve this challenge, we can leverage the Saga pattern. A Saga is a sequence of local transactions that happen in each microservice and together form a distributed transaction. In this case, the Saga is orchestrating using AWS step functions. If you'd like to learn more about distributed microservices application, I'd recommend the, watching the talk named Building Next-Gen Applications with Event-Driven Architecture. So it's now time to jump into the demo. In this demo, I will show you how the legacy Awesome Pets application performs by running a simple load test. I will then dig into some of the tooling available to find out why the monolithic application does not perform well. Then I will run the same load test 
on the microservices application and show you the differences between the two. Let me start by showing you a sample user journey on Awesome Pets. As you can see here, when I visit Awesome Pets, I am presented with the pets catalog. The catalog shows the pet types available in the inventory and account for each type. I can add pets to the cart by clicking on the Add to Cart button. And once I added all of the pets, I can take a look at the cart and proceed to the checkout. In the checkout page, I can enter all the details required to complete the transaction and confirm the payment. And once the confirmation message is displayed, the user journey is complete. So let's now run the load test to see how the monolithic application performs under load. There are many tools available to run performance tests, such as JMeter or Artillery, to name a few. But for this demo, I'm going to use BlazeMeter. This test simulates a real user journey on Awesome Pets, where each user will get the catalog, add an item to the cart, and submit an order. And the test is configured with a total of 50 concurrent users navigating through the journey for a total duration of 10 minutes. And the number of users will ramp up gradually over the duration of one minute. And lastly, this test will run in the Oregon AWS region. So I will now start the load test. And as the test takes about 10 minutes to complete, I will speed up the video and will take a look at the results once the test is complete. The test is now complete, and we can take a look at the results. In this screen, we have two graphs. The one on the left shows how many requests over the duration of the test succeeded and how many requests failed. And the graph on the right displays the average response time over the duration of the test. If we focus on the graph on the right, we can see that the number of users ramps up and the average response time of the application keeps increasing, reaching a peak response time of about seven seconds. And at some point, the response times drop drastically to a few hundreds of milliseconds. And after a few minutes, the response times go back up to seven seconds. So if we look at the graph on the left, it's clear why there's a drop in response time at around 1750. We can see that at this time, almost all of the requests fail, and there are no successful requests. And this tells us that the website was down during this time, and the user requests were failing very quickly. So let's go a bit deeper to see what's causing these issues. Here I am using AWS X-Ray, which is a tracing service to dive deeper into the failed request. From the X-Ray service map, I can see my monolithic application and the request going to the database. The red color here represents the amount of requests that have failed in the database. So I'm now going to use AWS X-Ray Insights. AWS X-Ray Insights identifies where in the application issues are occurring, the root cause of the issue, and the associated impact. When I open an insight, I can see immediately what is the root cause of the issue and what's the impact it's having. In this case, it's telling me that 23% of the requests to database failed. So I can then click on Analyze to drill down into individual failed requests. Once I open the failed request, I can see all the components that executed for this request, as well as how long each one of them took. In this specific case, database returned an error after 17 seconds due to a deadlock. Lastly, let's look at the database metrics to understand in a bit more details what happened. If we focus on the CPU utilization, we can see that the database CPU utilization spikes up to 100% very quickly as the traffic ramps up. And after a few minutes of sustained 100% utilization, the database CPU utilization goes back down to 0%. And then, back up to 100%. This is because the database crashed and restarted due to high CPU utilization. You can also validate this by looking at some of the other metrics, such as write IOPS and database connections. As we've seen, the legacy application does not scale well. Requests can take up to 10 seconds during the traffic peaks, and the database crashes, causing outages. And when there is a database issue, 
the entire application is affected. Instead, with this new target architecture, even if there is an issue with the order service, users are still able to browse the catalog and add items to the cart. Ultimately, by leveraging separate databases, Awesome Pets is also more resilient to failures, leading to better availability. So let's now run the same performance test on the new architecture to see how it performs. As you can see, I can add a parameter into the URL to start using the microservices backend. I have run the same amount of pets, if not more, compared to the monolithic application, and the functionality is exactly the same. So I can go ahead and open the test for the microservices backend. As you can see, the performance test has the same configuration of the previous test. The user journey is the same. We get in the catalog, add into the cart, and submitting an order. And also the configuration is the same with a 50 total users for a 10 minutes duration and a one minute ramp up. So let's go ahead and run this new test and take a look at the results once the test is complete. Like before, I will speed up this part of the video until the test completes. So let's take a look at these results. At a glance, we can already see that the performance is a lot more consistent. There were no errors during the performance test, and overall, the average response time is around 160 milliseconds, which is 45 times faster than our monolithic application. So let's now take a look at X-Ray. Here, we can see all of the interactions between the microservices. For example, we can see how the submit order functionality actually spans multiple microservices. And here we can see API calls for getting the catalog and adding items to the cart. So let's take a look at some specific traces to dive deeper on a single submit order request. Here we can see the breakdown of where the time was spent for the duration of the submit order transaction. We can see that under load, this operation took only about 300 milliseconds, which is 25 times faster than the submit order functionality in the monolithic application under the same conditions. With the performance test, we saw how the microservices architecture is able to scale well to cope with the traffic and provide consistent response times. Another characteristic of this new architecture is they can achieve a much greater availability. If one of the databases fail, only one of the microservices is affected, and the application can still partially function. Picking the right database for each microservice also allowed me to use features native to those technologies to implement specific functionalities. For example, using DynamoDB streams to notify changes in the inventory, or using the expiry feature of Redis to automatically delete cards after a fixed amount of time. In this session, we looked at what are today's modern application requirements. We then explored why customers move from a one-size-fits-all approach to purpose-built databases. We looked at how you can choose the right database for the right job, and we saw how it can help achieve greater scale, better performance, and greater availability. We covered a number of different topics in this session, but the learning doesn't have to stop here. We encourage you to check out our training and certification content. We offer over 500 free digital courses that can help you and your team build new cloud skills and learn about the latest services. And as you build your skills, consider preparing for one of our 11 AWS certifications. You can scan the QR codes in this slide to find out more. Thank you for attending this session. We would love to hear your feedback to help us improve the AWS Summit experience. So please remember to complete the session service. My name is Michele Ricciardi. Thank you again, and enjoy the rest of the AWS Summit.